Okay. Okay, can I start now? Yeah. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me here to, to speak. Uh, so my talk is based on some joint work together with uh, Stefano Giaccari, uh, who is a postdoc here in Padova. And we will hopefully put a, a paper on the archive uh, soon. Okay. So uh, what we want to do is to discuss some old problems about uh, all befalls in string theory, but from a, somehow a fresh perspective, uh, which is based on the recent pro uh, progress uh, on uh, uh, understanding symmetries in quantum field theory and string theory. Uh, so I think it's a good idea to start from uh, just reviewing some basic facts about global symmetries in quantum field theory. Uh, so there's been a huge amount of work in the last few years on this, on this topic, and uh, the idea was to try to uh, extend the uh, usual standard definition of a global symmetry as a uh, as a group of transformations acting on local operators and to extend it in many different directions. Uh, for example, one can uh, extend it to p form symmetries, which are uh, symmetries acting on operators of dimension p or higher than p. So a very simple example of this uh, p4 symmetries one uh, is, uh, uh, can be found just in uh, four-dimensional purely one gauge theory. So in this case, uh, there is a, uh, there are two uh, one-form global symmetries, uh, an electric E1 and a magnetic E1. And the electric one only acts on the um, Wilson loops on the theory, and the magnetic one acts on the uh, two of the lines. And for each generator of, of, of these two groups, there is actually a defect that one can find in an operator or a defect in, in space-time, which is um, supported on a on a closed manifold of dimension two. And the idea here is that uh, if we are in d dimensional space time, then uh, if we take some lines, closed lines, and some closed uh, co dimension two manifolds, then there is a well defined linking number between the two. And this defect here, uh, what it does is just uh, it adds on the Wilson lines, on the Wilson loops. Uh, that have non-trivial linking with the uh, with the manifold where it is supported. Okay, in the same mod, uh, in the same way, uh, these magnetic uh, defects uh, act on two lines which are which have non-trivial non-trivial linking number with the uh, with the two manifold. Up. So this connection between uh, symmetries and topological defects is quite general. So by topological, I mean that you can uh, take uh, continuous deformations of the of the defects uh, without changing correlation functions, so long as you don't cross the support of some other uh, operator in the correlation function. So, uh, in general, what happens is that uh, the standard zero form uh, global symmetries are related to codimension one topological defects. Uh, one form symmetries are, are related to codimension two uh, defects, and in general, p form symmetries are related to uh, co-dimension p plus one symmetries. So we can get to a higher level of complication if, if we consider some kind of higher group structure that makes p form symmetries with different degrees p. So these higher group structure are most easily described by coupling our um, global symmetries to some background gauge fields. Uh, so for example, you might have a, a theory which has a a zero form and a one form uh, global symmetries that you can couple them to some background gauge fields, which I call A1 and B2. And these gauge fields have their standard gauge parameters, lambda zero and capital lambda one. But then you might also have some strange mixing where the gauge parameter of the zero form symmetry uh, appears in the transformation of the gauge field of the one form symmetry. And this mixing is what um, is a signature of this uh, uh, higher, in, in this case, a two group structure. And it's controlled by this parameter kappa, kappa which by, consistency, by consi consistency must be quantized in a certain way. So that's kind of amusing. I would say that uh, all these structures actually appeared uh, 
has been known since uh, for many decades, I have to say, uh, but as gauge symmetries in string theory rather than global symmetries in quantum theory. So, uh, anyway, so uh, I would just like to mention another kind of uh, uh, possible extension of the idea of symmetries, uh, which consists in taking topological defects, which are non invertible. So, this means that when you take the fusion of two such topological defects, uh, then they do not obey some uh, group law, but some more general kind of uh, fusion law. And uh, um, it's, this means that these topolo non invertible topological defects do not form a group and do not form even a higher group, but they have some more complicated structure, which you can describe them in terms of a fusion category or some uh, generalization. So these guys were uh, first introduced into dimensional conformity theory some years ago, and uh, examples of this non-invertible symmetries in, um, in higher dimensions, as far as I know, was, have only appeared quite, quite recently. So closely related to the idea of, uh, of global symmetry does the idea of orbifolds. So the orbifold is a way to obtain a new quantum field theory from an old one by gauging some finite global symmetric group G. So I will always talk about orbifolds uh, referring to finite groups, okay? So what this means is that uh, you just take your original theory and you couple to some uh, background uh, G gauge field. So you, you put some uh, G bundle on your space time and you couple your theory to it. And then what you have to do uh, to make the gauge field dynamics is you sum over all uh, inequivalent configurations for your gauge fields, so in particular your uh, non-isomorphic gauge bundles, and you might uh, sum over them with some suitable weights, and this makes the gauge fields essentially dynamics, and what you obtain is a new, is a new theory. Now, there are possible inconsistencies in, in doing this, but they are quite well understood, and they are essentially classified by uh, two of the anomalies. Uh, there is a nice description of all defaults in terms of topological defects. So suppose that you, are, you have a global uh, a group of uh, zero quark symmetries, so they are associated with uh, co-dimension one defects. So a um, gauge background for this, uh, uh, for this uh, symmetry group can be understood as uh, the insertion of a, a network of such defects in space-time. And the idea is that this network, which looks something like this, just separates the space-time into different patches, and the defects dictate the transition functions from one patch to the other. So it's essentially equivalent to giving uh, to giving a bundle uh, for the group G. And then to make the the field the gauge field dynamical, you have to sum over all inequivalent networks uh, subject to some consistency relations. And for example, the junctions of two uh, defects or various defects must be consistent with the with the group law for your group. And this picture has uh, is nice because it generalizes very uh, very easily to um, to more general cases. For example, you can pick your defaults by uh, non-invertible defects if it's a network of non-invertible defects here, or even higher form symmetries. So for higher form symmetries, instead of having a network of co-dimension one defects, you have higher networks of higher co-dimension. So what about what about string theory? So string theory is a theory of quantum gravity, and there's a famous conjecture that uh, in theories of quantum gravity, there should be no global uh, symmetries. So there is quite some evidence in favor of this conjecture, uh, especially for continuous gauge groups. And I I'm not going to discuss this evidence, but I will just take this conjecture uh, assume that this conjecture is true. Okay, so my if you want my my results will be conditional to this conjecture being true. Okay, and now if you take just naively on the face of it, then uh, you cannot give the same definition of orbifolds in string theory as you did in quantum field theories. Uh, so you can define the gauging of some global symmetries in space time, simply because the, there aren't any global symmetries in space time. Okay, on the other hand. We do talk about string orbifolds uh, uh, the whole day, so uh, there is a way to make sense of this. So one way to make sense of this is the following. Uh, how do you define uh, uh, some string theory model? 
Uh, well, a standard like textbook way to define it is uh, you start from a, a conformance with theory on the worksheet of a fundamental string. And uh, this conformance with theory essentially, uh, um, uh, giving this conformance with theory is enough to uh, reconstruct uh, the whole uh, string theory model that you want to reconstruct, for example, the uh, spectrum of massless fields, and then the, uh, you can deduce the presence of T brains, NS5 brains, etc., etc., etc. Now, uh, the worksheet, the theory in the worksheet is a quantum field theory and can have some global symmetry, G. And often these global symmetries on the worksheet just stand to exact symmetries in the string theory. And by our no global symmetries conjecture, this must be. Uh, these symmetries in the watch in the in the space time must be must be gauge symmetries. Okay, and this is what we observe uh, many many points. But now we have a quantum field theory with a global symmetry, and then what we can do is uh, we take the orbifold of it. So when we do a worship orbifold. This defines a new worship quantum field theory, and from this you can define your new string theory model. And this is what we mean or one of the meanings you can give to all the faults in string theory. Uh, now, this is all well known and very well understood if you want. On the other hand, it's not completely satisfactory because somehow you would like to be able to define what the orbital is. So to pass from string theory model A to string theory model B without having to go through, uh, through the worship. Okay. So uh, in particular, uh, you know, the fundamental string is just one among many dynamical objects that we have in string theory. And dualities exchange the different dynamical objects with, the, with each other. So you would like to have a way to define your orbifold, which does not depend on the choice of a particular duality frame. Uh, of course, this is not the only way that, that you can use to define orbifolds in string theory. Uh, another way is, is the following. So you can start by defining your string model by getting, uh, by telling me, giving me a geometric background. So you can tell me, okay, take type 2A on a torus or on a calabia. Then this geometric background might, might have some uh, isometries. And what you do to, to make the orbifold, you plainly take the geometric orbifold in a sense. So you identify um, points in your geometric background that are identified by the isometry. So in this way, you obtain a new background and this defines for you a new string theory model. Uh, on the other hand, even this approach, so this is not a worship approach if you want, this is uh, more of a space time approach to, uh, to orbifolds. And it turns out to be essentially equivalent to this, this worship approach in the sense that you get the, essentially the same string theory models on this side. But again, it's not, this is not, again, quite a uh, duality invariant if you want. It still depends a bit on the, on the choice of duality frame. So to stress this, let let me, let me take this example. Let me take, for example, um, a dual pair of string theories given by type 2A on a K3 model and heterotic on T4. So these are defined by very different geometric backgrounds. Uh, so it's not, easy, it's not obvious that what you mean by orbifold on one side uh, is the same as what you mean by orbifold on, on the other side. Now, you might have... Um, now, the, you might have two different like, philosophical perspectives, if you want, on, on dualities in string theory. So from one perspective, you, you can say that type 2A on K3 and heterotic on T4 are just two different uh, gravity theories. And the duality means that there is a non-trivial equivalence between these two different theories. And from a different perspective, you might say that, well, these two guys just define the same quantum gravity theory, and these are like two different descriptions of the same gravity theory. So this is just a, like a philosophical difference in the sense that it just depends on uh, what you mean by theory, what you mean by description. So it's not that one is right and one is wrong, but they give a bit of a different perspective on, on orbifolds, if you want. So from a first, from a first perspective, uh, you have these two different theories then you might have, I don't know, some isometries of the K3 model, and you take an orbifold on this side, and you take a, you obtain a new string theory model. And then you do the same thing on the other side, and you, doing, you obtain again a new string theory model. And then it's not obvious at all 
that the new model that you obtain are actually equal to each other. So this was very well discussed, like in the mid nineties by people like Papa uh, Witten or uh, San. And uh, what you need from this perspective is a very good argument to argue that the two orbitals that you obtain are actually dual, still dual to each other. And for example, they propose some adiabatic argument that uh, goes into this direction. Uh, but then the adiabatic argument not always works. And then uh, what you can get is that uh, the orbital on one side uh, is not equivalent to the orbital in, in the other side. This is kind of rare, but, but it can happen. This are, there are apparently some examples of this. And what people are used, used to say is that uh, dualities do not always commute with orbitals. On the other hand, from the other perspective, uh, if you have a unique theory, and these are just two descriptions of the unique theory, then getting to different orbitals is a bit, is a bit fishy because uh, somehow this means that um, the orbital procedure that you are implementing uh, is a bit, is description dependent. It's not based on your intrinsic property of your theory, but it's based on the description of your theory. And this is very different from uh, orbitals in quantum field theory. So in quantum field theory, when you do an orbifold, uh, the data that you need to specify the orbifold are just the global symmetries of your quantum field theory and how all states and observables transform under this global symmetry. So uh, these are just intrinsic properties of your, of your theory. They do not depend on how you describe them. And uh, it can happen actually in quantum field theory that uh, for a given theory with a given group of symmetries, uh, you might have more than one consistent orbifold. This is the case where you, the case where you have like discrete uh, torsion. But in any case, you can classify all possible consistent orbifolds. There are always infinite number, and they do not depend on how you describe your initial theory. They're just intrinsic. So you would expect that the same thing happens in, uh, for string theory, for orbifolds in string theory, uh, that orbifolds only depend on the intrinsic properties of the string theory that, the, that you started. And actually, uh, in some sense, uh, you do need a common language between these two different duality frames, even to be able to match symmetries on the two sides. So how do you match symmetries on the two sides? Uh, well, you can describe the theory that you get from these compatifications in a kind of common way. So you can say that from these compatifications, you obtain some quantum gravity theory in uh, space time, which has uh, six uncompatified dimensions. Uh, maybe you want to take them asymptotically in Minkowski, for example. And then uh, a generic point in the modular space, you have a, a, a group of gauge symmetries of zero form gauge symmetries, which is Generically, you want to the 24. And you have various kinds of objects, like point like objects, which are charged under this you want to the 24 gauge symmetry. And these objects have very different descriptions in these two duality frames. So they might be um, D branch wrapping cycles for in type 2A, and they are like heterotic strings carrying like winding and momentum in, the, uh, in this other duality frame. But actually, we can just you know, characterize this, uh, you know, detect a given object just by telling me what is the, uh, the charge of these objects with respect to this uh, gauge symmetry in space time. Now, this is the generic gauge symmetry. Uh, then it, this gauge symmetry can get enhanced in some special points in the modular space. So in particular, you can get like um, non-abelian continuous gauge symmetries, but you can also get uh, gauge symmetries of this form where you still have a continuous normal subgroup, which is U1 to the 24, and then you have a semi-direct product with, a, with some finite group G. So these kind of families are uh, particularly nice because uh, this gauge group, finite gauge group G, actually um, can be seen as a, as a global symmetry from a worship point of view, uh, both on the type 2A and the autoerotic string side. So they, this just arises as global symmetries on the worship theory on both sides. So you can take the orbitals from the worship point of view on both sides, okay? And you know that you are doing the orbitals by the same group because they correspond to the same gauge group from the, from the space-time point of view, okay? And that's how you match uh, symmetries on both sides. 
And so you take the orbifold on this side, you take the orbifold on this side, and you get some, some new theories, okay, possibly different on the two sides in some cases. On the other hand, if you look at what this orbifold does in, from space time point of view, so from a very rough point of view, what it does, you just project out some degrees of freedom of your original theory. And this part is, is, is always the same in the, in the two duality frames. And then you add some twisted sector, which completes, if you want, your sub theory to something which is, uh, which is consistent. And that's where the differences may arise in the two duality frames. So in the addition of this, this twisted sector. So from the point of view of this space-time description, uh, these cases, these examples where uh, duality does not commute with orbifolds, uh, really look a bit like uh, discrete torsion in a sense. So you start with the given theory at the beginning, and then you don't have just a, a single possible outcome of your orbital procedure, but you have simply two consistent outcomes of your orbital procedure. And one of these outcomes might be uh, very natural and very uh, well visible from one duality, in one duality frame, and the other one might be uh, natural to see in, uh, in the other duality frames. But nevertheless, they give rise to a consistent, consistent string theory models at the end. So what we would like is to uh, try to uh, describe what we do when we do an orbit fold, not from the point of view of a particular duality frame, but using this common language, which means just specifying that they have a quantum gravity theory in certain number of uncompatified dimensions uh, with a certain gauge group with some objects that transform in this, uh, that are charged under this gauge. And this is the, the goal of our, uh, of our work, essentially. So this is not completely obvious because, of course, these are not global symmetries from the space time point of view. These are gauge symmetries. So it's not clear what we are doing from, from this kind of point of view. So let me just give some part of motivations for what we do. So as I said, this is one reason for this is to understand to have a, a duality invariant formulation of orbital system theory. Another reason is that uh, if you do orbitals from the worksheet point of view, uh, you know how to treat them. You know that you might have, for example, some uh, obstructions to taking orbitals, et cetera. But it's not completely clear what, what the space-time interpretation of, for example, Toft anomalies on the worksheet. So these are anomalies on the worksheet theories. They're not anomalies in space-time theory. So how do you interpret these obstructions to, to taking orbitals? Uh, another reason, as I said, is try to understand the cases where uh, dualities do not commute with orbitals. And these are kind of interesting because they really suggest that if you are able to specify orbifolds using this kind of space-time language, uh, you might be able to generalize what you mean by orbifolds to, uh, which means that there are some orbifolds proof, consistent orbifold procedures, which are not completely uh, natural or obvious from the worship point of view. And that would be very interesting to, uh, to explore. And finally, just, let me just mention that what I would like to do uh, is that uh, I would like not just to take a single gravity theory, okay, but also to consider families of, of uh, gravity theories, uh, which might have a, uh, the same symmetry group G. So we saw that this kind of families appear in the case of uh, dual pairs of type 2A and uh, on K3 and uh, heterotic on T4. And what we'd like to do is that our orbital procedure given such a family of theories, should produce a family of orbital theories. And that's kind of nice because, you know, you might object that uh, these two descriptions, okay, of, of your uh, quantum gravity theory, of course, they're not valid in the same region in the moduli space. So this is only valid in a certain region of the moduli space, and this is valid in a completely different region in the moduli space. So if you want, if you are sitting in a certain point in the modular space, it, in some sense, you, you do have a preferred duality frame, which is more, uh, more natural. On the other hand, these families of groups, of, of, of uh, theories with groups, uh, may very well stand just from uh, one corner of the modular space to the other corner of the modular space. And you will really like to have a uniform procedure to get a uh, to define the orbifold on the whole family 
and not just on the regions where you have one or the other um, description of your, of your string theory. So, so the idea of the other work is to give some kind of a uh, proposal for this orbifolds, for this description of orbifolds from the points of view of space time. So this is very tentative, so, but let me just tell you how, uh, how it should work. So the, the starting point is you have to give me some data about, of course, the um, parent string model, okay? And I would, like you, I would like to have some data which doesn't quite depend on a particular duality frame that you use to, to describe your stream model. Okay, so we have a bit in mind the example that I just made of type and a 3 and heterotic on E40. This. So what we can say is that our string theory model uh, will describe some gravity theory, uh, which has, say, D uncompatified dimensions, and let's take them uh, as being asymptotic elementos. So I'm not specifying any geometry or topology uh, that might possibly be in some compatified directions. And also I'm not specifying what's the geometry or the topology in the interior of space time, because in principle that might fluctuate in, a, in quantum gravity theories. And then if you want to define an orbifold, it's kind of unavoidable that you have to give me some information about the symmetries that are in this, this theory. So we have, what you have to tell me is uh, the gauge group of the theory. So there are no global symmetries, so the only possibility is to give me a gauge group. So this means in particular that you have to give me all uh, P-form components of your gauge group, and you also have to keep into account of the possible higher group structure between these two different, different components. Uh, now, you might be very worried at this point because uh, I said that uh, the properties, the data that I want to start with, uh, should be somehow intrinsic, some intrinsic data in some sense of, your, uh, of my string model, at least not depend on duality frames. And in general, the gauge group of a certain theory is the typical example of a property that does, the, which is not intrinsic. So it does depend in general on uh, how you describe your theory. And that's very well known from quantum field theories. You have many examples of quantum field theories that have one description where uh, they can be described for as gauge theories for some group. And then they have a dual description where the gauge group is completely different, or maybe it's not even a gauge theory in a dual, in a dual description. And that's not inconsistent because, of course, uh, all observables in your theory are actually required to be uh, gauge invariant. So uh, you don't really see this gauge group on, on, on observables. Uh, on the other hand, there is there can be some uh, like intrinsic signature of a presence of a gauge group, uh, which in particular involves the, the global part of your gauge group. So the global part of your gauge group, or if you want, uh, uh, is allowed really to act non-trivially on the states of your theory. And uh, in particular, if, you, if your theory has, uh, is allowed to have states that have non-trivial um, non total charge under your gauge group. So for example, if you have uh, um, a quantum gravity theory with a uh, U1 symmetry, uh, you might want to have a states where you have a, a non-zero electric charge with, your, with respect to this U1 gauge symmetry. And having this uh, uh, electric charge uh, isn't the possibility of having electric charge, it is an intrinsic property of your theory. So uh, the global parts of your gauge groups are not forbidden in quantum gravity theories. Uh, what the no global symmetries conjecture tells you is that uh, every global, if you want, symmetries in, in, uh, in, in gravity theory is really the global part of a, of a, of a gauge theory. So, uh, so what you do is, so there is some kind of intrinsic meaning to, to having a gauge group, at least if, uh, if your theory contains uh, charged objects uh, that, um, uh, with respect to which uh, your, your gauge group acts, acts non trivially. okay? So, of course, you want to define your gauge group in a way which is quite democratic under like electric magnetic dualities for so for example type 2a theories you might want to include uh, all um, p-form gauge symmetries for all uh, of values of p uh, even if 
uh, you know that they are related by some kind of electromagnetic quality. So you might have like constraints between them, but uh, you want to use, you know, uh, as, as democratic as possible description of this gauge group. So I'm not including in the gauge group, the uh, group of diffeomorphisms in the d-dimensional space-time. Uh, so, because it's uh, kind of too complicated in a sense. And so when I'm, when I'm talking about uh, gauge invariant, um, gauge invariant operators, I really mean operators that are invariant under uh, some internal group H, but they might not be uh, diff invariant, okay? Uh, so you have this gauge group, and then, and then of course, in string theory, you have all kind of dynamical objects uh, which are uh, charged under this under this gauge group. So you have strings, brains, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and you might have uh, various degrees of freedoms on the on the war volume of these dynamical objects that kind of affect the way these uh, these objects are coupled to the, to the gauge group. So this is essentially the kind of initial data that one wants to give. And now what we want to do is to define what we mean by orbifold string theory, orbifold by some finite subgroup. And uh, let me take just a, a, a billion, in particular cyclic finite subgroup of the zero form part of my gauge group. So that's kind of the, what you usually do with orbifolds. So the idea, so the goal is to give like a series, a series of rules that allows me to construct a new orbifold model. And these rules should coincide uh, almost always with what we mean, we usually mean by string theory orbifold from the point of view of the uh, worksheet orbifold or the background orbifold, et cetera, but might be possibly more general. So how do we define this uh, orbifold from this, from this kind of data? So uh, this group G is, a, is a, a subgroup of the gauge group of your theory. And there is a, uh, another conjecture about quantum gravity theories, which is called the completeness conjecture, that essentially tells you that there must be uh, actual dynamical objects that uh, are charged so are in uh, uh, any possible representations of your uh, gauge group G. So this is a zero form gauge group. So in particular, you expect to have uh, point like operators. Now, of course, a single local operator which transforms in some non trivial representation of G is not gauge invariant. So, this is not allowed, of course, this, this guy alone. But for example, you can have uh, in general uh, a gauge invariant uh, operator that um, is given by uh, two local operators which are charged under your uh, gauge group and then connected by some, some Wilson line. Okay, this is, uh, this is allowed. So one way to express this, uh, this conjecture here is by saying that uh, all Wilson lines in your theory for any representation of your gauge group uh, are actually allowed to end on some local operator. So they are endable Wilson lines, okay? So this endability of Wilson lines is closely related to the absence of global symmetries. And in general, if, if, if you have a gauge theory, so let me just talk in terms of gauge theory here as a, I'm, I'm using really a gauge theory language here. So in terms of gauge theory, uh, if all the um, Wilson lines of your uh, um, coral representation are non endable uh, then you always have a, a, some kind of higher form, in particular, one form global symmetries. And this one form global symmetry is given by this, this kind of default operators that I described at the beginning of my talk in the case of U1 theory. So these are all usually called the group of Witten operators. So they are co-dimension two defects that might have a non-trivial linking with your Wilson loop and act non-trivially on your Wilson loop, okay? So this kind of symmetries are only present if your uh, Wilson lines uh, cannot be open, essentially, okay? Because if the Wilson lines can be consistently open, then you can, uh, essentially, the linking number with your book of Witten operator doesn't make any sense, so you don't have uh, really a global symmetry for this case. So the fact that the Wilson lines are endable in your string theory is, uh, um, is directly related to the fact that you do not have a global symmetries 
actually acting on this loop. So what's the idea to get now the orbifold theory? So the idea is let us try to somehow restore this, this global symmetry that in our original theory is, is broken. So we, well, what we do want to do is to exclude all operators where non-trivial Wilson lines can end. So if we exclude this, these operators from our original string theory, then we have uh, all Wilson lines become non-endable. Okay. And then in principle, we might have a one form global symmetry in our theory. So this one form global symmetry is not broken anymore and it should restore. Now, if the final product of our orbital procedure is a consistent theory on gravity, we should not have a one form global symmetry. Okay, so we cannot have this global symmetry in our final orbital theory. So in our apparent theory, this global symmetry was broken by the presence of this charge operators. So what happens in the orbital theory is that this global symmetry is gauged, okay? So instead of being broken, we just gauge it. And what happens with this, with gauging this global symmetry is that, well, first of all, our non-endable Wilson loops uh, are excluded from our theory because they're not gauge invariant. They're not invariant under this symmetry here, which has become a, 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 a gauge symmetry. And effectively, what happens is that uh, at the level of the gauge group of your original theory, uh, the gauge subgroup G is quotiented out of your, of your gauge group H. Okay. And this is kind of, uh, I mean, it's clear that it has to be like that because uh, if you don't include the Wilson loops, then it's clear that you cannot have the corresponding, uh, the corresponding gauge group. So this G is quotiented out of the group H. So you see that this is what they expect somehow, even from uh, or before procedure from the uh, worksheet point of view, uh, where the, from the point of view of uh, uh, global um, symmetries on the worksheet, what happens when you take the R record is that somehow you quotient out the, um, the group G from, the, from your group of symmetries. And this first, this first step here, uh, from the point of view of the, of the worksheet of your of your string theory, just instructs you to, uh, for example, to throw away all uh, configurations on the worksheet of your string theory uh, that transform non-trivially under your uh, symmetry proof G. But it also instructs you to do the same thing for all kinds of other dynamical objects like uh, D brains, uh, five brains, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So what happens at the end? So is that this group G is quotiented out. And the group of Witten operator, which were uh, like this topological operator that appeared in this like intermediate step of your order for procedure, are actually uh, not there anymore because they are essentially unobservable. They are pure gauge. So the gauging of these guys correspond essentially to putting some network of this group of Witten operators. But once you sum over all of them, the path integral, they just, um, they're just equivalent to uh, to not having any, any network essentially, okay? So we are not done yet. So we need to add some uh, twisted sector. So some new operators, some new objects in our steam theory for, for consistency with this procedure. So first of all, since we gauged, we quotiented out this uh, subgroup G in our uh, gauge group, then we, we are allowed to have new magnetic configurations for our gauge group. Uh, or, and even new, uh, new gauge bundles for our gauge group, essentially because we can have gauge bundles where the transition functions only closed um, um, up to G transformations. Once we question out G transformation, these are, these are allowed gauge bundles. So we have to add the corresponding uh, magnetic monopoles. But we also have to do something different. We have also to uh, add some vortex operators on the world volume of each dynamical object uh, that is um, where the, the essentially the fields on the world volume uh, are allowed to have no trivial monodromy um, with respect to elements of your gauging group G. And the reason for this is that, so in the original theory, uh, if you have a trivial background for G, uh, you were not allowed 
allowed to have any non-trivial monotony under G for the, for the um, fields in your uh, in the word volume of your dynamical objects. But these fields could appear if you put your dynamical objects uh, in some non-trivial gauge background for G. Okay, and so in, in fact, the, the gauge bundle that you decide for your gauge group G uh, dictates uh, that the uh, behavior of your worksheet fields uh, in the of the word volume fields in, a, in any dynamical object. Okay? They have to be sections of the corresponding uh, vector bundle uh, corresponding to this gauge bundle. Okay. Now, once you somehow gauge out this uh, um, group of written operators, so you quotient out this group G, then uh, all uh, what happens essentially is that all um, gauge bundles that differ by uh, G transformations are actually equivalent to each other. In particular, G bundles are essentially uh, equivalent to a trivial bundle. So this means that in your in the whole volume of your of your theory, uh, you must be able to have all possible monodromies uh, for your G, irrespectively of the um, configuration, for example, of your network of group of written operators. Okay, essentially because your group of written operators after the gauging are not observable, are not observable. So this means that you have to introduce all these um, um, mono, all these kind of monodromy fields in your in your worksheet, for example, of string theory, and you have to insert operators on the word volume of your fields that create this kind of uh, non-trivial G monodromy around them. Okay. So okay. So the basic idea is um, you start from a theory which has a, a, a certain gauge group G, and then uh, you pass through an intermediate step, which is a some kind of inconsistent theory which has potentially global symmetries. Okay. And what to do, you instead of these global symmetries were broken in your, in your original parent theory and you just gaze them. Okay. And what you have to do then is that you try to complete your uh, string theory in such a way that it is a consistent theory of quantum gravity. And to do that, you have to give uh, what you can do is to follow some uh, consistency conditions. So, for example, uh, you might. Uh, so, one of the strongest in a sense consistency condition that you might require is that the final product of your orbital procedure should have no global symmetries. And this is actually very constraining in the sense that requiring no global symmetries um, puts very strong constraints on what kind of dynamical objects you need to have in your string theory and what kind of word volume um, fields they might carry, et cetera. Then more generally, you might have more general consistency condition, while the classical one is a uh, that cancellation. Uh, there might be more general consistency conditions. And one of the missing points, if you want, in our procedure is, uh, is a bit of a systematic classification of what this consistency condition would be. And uh, this is somehow also uh, one of the missing points in trying to uh, apply this procedure to um, to more complicated cases. So let me give, so this was very vague. So let me give a, a very simple example of this. Actually, the simplest, simplest example I can think about. So take, for example, type two on, on a circle. So this defines a nine dimension, nine dimensional, uh, a fear of gravity in nine extended dimensions, non compatible dimensions. And let me focus on some like, subgroup of my gauge group in this case. Which has this form. So I have two uh, U1 uh, zero form symmetries and I have a, a, a one form symmetry. So this is just uh, uh, related to shifts in the thermal dimension. This is shifts along the uh, dual torus. And this is the usual uh, one form symmetry related to the uh, Calber among the P2 fields. So these theories here have a um, non trivial two group structure, which is well known. So um, in the gauge transformation of your B2 field, there is a dependence on the uh, gauge parameter of your you know, of uh, one of these uh, zero form symmetries and uh, um, on the field strength of the other form symmetry. So this is just a two group two group structure, which is you know very well known. 
And um, what this tells you is that uh, the, the gauge infinite field strength is of, a, of a B2 is not just the B2, but it has some correction terms. And this correction terms give rise to some sinus terms of space time. Now, the, the goal is to define the more stupid orbifold instant theory, which is uh, we orbifold by the Z2 symmetry, uh, Z2 subgroup of this U1, A1. Uh, what is this? It's just a shift of by half period along the circle S1. So this is really uh, a, a, a very obvious thing. We know very well what the result is. You just get the compatification of a circle, which is uh, half the radius of the, of the original one. But that, I, I will actually manage to make this, uh, this orbifold look very complicated. So let me try to succeed in this. So what the first part of our uh, conjecture says is, uh, of our proposal says is that, well, we have to project out all operators which carry um, non-trivial charge under this G2 gauge group. So this means that they have uh, odd momentum along the S1. So we exclude all objects that have odd momentum with respect to the, along the uh, circle. And the idea is that we would like to restore a one fold symmetry uh, which is related to this to this kind of defect, which is the exponential of the um, of um, the Hodge dual of F two in uh, um, on any closed manifold and so on. So this is uh, this is essentially the um, um, higher form uh, global symmetry, uh, electric global symmetry, which is related to this U uh, one gauge group. Okay. Now, this is, of course, naive because essentially because we have these charge Hyman's terms. So let me just show this again in a slightly naive way. So if you take some subset of a, uh, equation of motion, well, the anchor identities, then for this theory, then they look a bit like this schematically. So these are the, like the massless fields. And on the right, I just put some uh, localized sources, uh, localized and quantized sources, which are like uh, strings, frames, whatever carrying. Uh, momentum in the compact direction. So if I didn't have this transcinous term, uh, it would be really sufficient to require that uh, all these quantized sources just, uh, just carry uh, even momentum in the, in the compact direction. So, but due to this term, then things are not so easy because essentially this term is neither quantized nor um, no localized. So this is very well known um, issue when we have just sinus terms. So this will be essentially a, a, a Maxwell charge for a theory. Uh, so what you can do is to try to go to some uh, page chart. So you uh, uh, you um, modify this uh, this guy here by adding uh, this other term, okay? Which is such that the differential of this guy is exactly what we have on this side of this equation. Uh, but the problem with this definition is that this is not quite gauge invariant. So if you do a gauge transformation for B1, then you get an additional term, which is uh, a closed form, but not exact. And when you integrate over M7, uh, then you get shifts by integers. So this guy, this integral here is only defined up to, uh, um, is well defined only up to integers, uh, which is not, is not very good. I mean, because this means that this guy is not. It's not really well defined. So what you will really, and in general, you know, when you have such a transcendence term in action, uh, you cannot quite consistently uh, throw out throw out all electric sources for, uh, or even electric sources for your gauge field A1, because you can just create them by uh, taking some uh, solitonic um, uh, configurations, which involve this, this term here. So what, what you would really like to have is to have essentially a factor of two appearing here, which means a factor of two appearing here. This would cure more or less everything because with a factor of two, this guy would be uh, gauge invariant up to uh, even integers, which means that this guy would be essentially well-defined. And then um, the electric sources that which are given by uh, the transcendence time would be on the even charges, which, uh, which are kind of accepted in our orbital theory. So there is a nice way to, an easy way to obtain this factor of two. Okay, let's start. And it's the following. 
So first of all, uh, we look at the, um, what we do, we throw away all magnetic charges for all B1 fields, uh, which carry out all the magnetic charge. So these are like uh, uh, essentially um, five brains. So we take only an even number, if you want, of five brains. So once you throw out some of the uh, objects of your, of your string theory, what you get uh, is that uh, you kind of restore some kind of global symmetry. And in this case, uh, what you restore is this kind of Z2 symmetry, okay, which is the magnetic, is part of a, a magnetic higher form symmetry, which is related to this gauge field D1. Okay. So, well, so in your final orbital theory, you can not have a global symmetry, what you do is you gauge this Z2 global symmetry. So the original theory was broken and the final theory is gauged. So the consequence of this gauging is that uh, in the parent theory, you have a U1, B1 gauge group. In your final theory, this group gets extended by a Z2 subgroup, okay? So you have a non-trivial extension of your gauge group so that the new gauge group, which is this uh, uh, B2 uh, B one group, is a, a non-trivial double covering of this guy. So what this means is that uh, in your, with respect to your new group, uh, you have somehow uh, less available magnetic ch charges because uh, only even only magnetic charges which are even with respect to the old group uh, lift to well-defined magnetic charges in your double covering. And at the same time, this new this extended group has more uh, the possibility of more consistent electric charges, uh, which essentially means that you can have um, a half integral winding along the along the uh, combat direction. Uh, so with this, after this gauging, you are kind of done in a sense that um, now this object here, this object here is now uh, well-defined. And that's because essentially what you did is that you change the quantization condition on your uh, B1 field. So it's not a standardly quantized um, U1 gauge field, but it's twice a, a U1 gauge field with standard quantization, which means that uh, under uh, gauge transformations, uh, this integral here uh, shifts by even integers, and that's enough to have a, a well-defined operator here. So now we restore this global symmetry here, just throwing away all the uh, electric uh, charges for our, um, for our A1. And then what you do is you just have to, to gauge this global symmetry. And the effect of doing of gauging this global symmetry is to introduce um, new magnetic uh, monopoles, new magnetic uh, configurations in the theory. So these new magnetic configurations correspond essentially to uh, Kaluza Klein monopoles carrying uh, magnetic charges which are half integral from the point of view of your uh, original theory. And then you obtain, you also have to add all this uh, vortex configuration on the Bohr volume of your uh, of your dynamical objects, and this includes the twisted sector on your uh, fundamental strings, but also all kind of uh, fractional uh, brains for um, for all the other brains. Now, the bottom line of this of this uh, derivation uh, is the following: so uh, we wanted to gauge a subgroup uh, to take the R before by a subgroup of this U one group, but we were not really able to do that. Okay. Uh, you really have to act not only on this uh, uh, A1 gauge field, but you also have simultaneously to act non-trivially on this B1 field. So uh, this means that you have to gauge not only this guy, this wouldn't make sense, wouldn't make, wouldn't be even consistent. You have to gauge simultaneously also this other guy here. So the effects of these two gauges are the following. The, as I said, the B1, gauge group gets extended by C2, while the uh, A1 gauge group gets uh, quotiented by the C2, okay? Now, if you are not convinced by the, the um, derivation, this argument of uh, equational motion and, and um, uh, Bianchi identities, you can actually, uh, you can actually uh, convince yourself that this is the case just looking at the structure of your gauge group. So if you, if you wanted to like change the quantization condition, if you want, of your 
uh, u1 a1 gauge field then what to do is that you uh, what we would get is to change the quantization condition on this uh, f2 term here and this wouldn't be compatible with the quantization of your b2 field in the gauge so what you have to do is to change also the quantization conditions for this uh, gauge parameter here in such a way that this product is quantized in a way which is compatible with with b2 and this leads me to somehow a, a last point that i want to make uh, which is the relation so this was a simple example but there's actually a, a kind of lesson that one can learn from this which is a relation between the token anomalies on the worksheet and the structure of the um, gauge group in your space time now suppose in general that you start with a uh, a string theory which has a worse CFT uh, with some global symmetry G. And suppose that this extends towards an exact symmetry of your, of your string theory. And so this G could be in the previous example was, for example, uh, U1 cross U1 given by shifts on the torus and shift on the dual circle. Uh, but it can be mm, more generally also a discrete group or a finite group. Or so let me take, for example, a finite group. Can be a finite subgroup of this. Now, in general, this G can have a, a Toft anomaly in the on the worship, which is an obstruction to taking R before by G. And this Toft anomaly is, is um, measured by a particular uh, cohomology class in this um, in this group cohomology. Okay. Now, if this is a, an exact symmetry of the spin theory, then in space time this must be a gauge symmetry. Okay. So there must be uh, some gauge fields here. And you can, in principle, think of uh, turning on some non-trivial gauge backgrounds for, uh, for your group G. Uh, and now you can think of having those strings, the fundamental strings, in a non-trivial gauge background for G. But this is problematic because if the total anomaly is non-zero, uh, the worship theory in a non-trivial gauge, in non-trivial G, back, G background, is not quite gauge invariant. This is essentially what your worship Toft anomaly tells you. So this is not a problem from a worship point of view, because from the worship point of view, this is a global symmetry, so okay, it can be broken. But this would be a problem from the space-time point of view, because this is a gauge symmetry, so you cannot like uh, non-trivially couple. Uh, you know, you cannot couple in a non-gauge invariant way to your fundamental string. So the solution to this is that uh, when you have such a situation, your B2 field must transform non-trivially under G in a structure which is a, a, a essentially a higher group structure. And this higher group structure is essentially uh, determined by this uh, homology class here. So this, uh, there is a very explicit expression for this. So the, the high group structure is such that the uh, gauge invariant field strength must be db2 by uh, plus a certain term, which depends on your gauge anomaly. So with this kind of transformation, what you get is essentially a green Schwartz mechanism on the, on the string worksheet so that the transformation of b2 under g just cancels the anomaly of the rest. So this is what happens on your case of your u1 cross u1 uh, example that you saw before. And that's you, you can use this to derive the, uh, um, the structure on the gauge group in that things. But this must happen uh, much more generally, even for a finite gauge group, for finite groups of symmetries. So you, you must have this kind of uh, two group structure in space time whenever you have some non trivial uh, Toft anomaly on the worship. And what this tells you is that in space time, you must have some kind of chance time monsters. In a sense, of space time action. And this also tells you uh, that um, uh, you have some restrictions in how you do your R before from space time point of view. So, uh, suppose first that the restriction of your anomaly to some subgroup of your gate of your um, symmetry group G vanishes, then the R before the CFT R before by G prime is consistent in this case. So, if you do this thing, uh, from the space time point of view, uh, this is also consistent. Uh, however, uh, it might still be the case that there is a mixed soft anomaly between this subgroup and another subgroup G second inside the symmetry. So if this is the case, then you cannot quite just uh, 
simply gauge your, uh, take a simple log of four by G, uh, G prime, but you do have, to, you do have to do something with this other gauge group, which is second. So this is the example that we just saw. So the mixed of anomalies between the two ones on the worksheet translates in this mixed term where you have a gauge parameter for one group or the field strength for the other group. So you cannot change the quantization of one guy without acting on the other guy. So this is an effect of this Toft anomaly in from the worship one group. So what happens if the restriction of this anomaly to the group you want to orbit for by is not, is not zero? Well, from the worship point of view, the orbit for is not consistent. So what happens in space time? So what happens in space time is that you have some kind of two group structure uh, where, however, the uh, gauge parameter and the field strength uh, are not of two different groups, but they are related to the same group. And in this case, you have kind of no possibility of change of quantizations of these guys because uh, they're, not, they're not independent, they are the same gauge group. So if you change the quantization of the gauge parameter, you change the quantization of the field strength in the same way. And then this is not compatible anymore with the quantization of P2. So what happens in space time is that you really do not have simply this gauge group, the zero form gauge group there, because the zero form gauge group is non-trivially um, involved in some higher group structure from the space time point of view. And that's the reason why you cannot quite take the orbit fold uh, in that case. Okay. So what I want to stress is that all these explanations actually are, uh, they do not depend on uh, the particular description that you give to your uh, dynamical of dynamical space time or uh, to taking some equations in motion or some dynamics, but they really are built in the structure of the gauge group that you have in your um, space time theory. So I'm like uh, out of time. So let me give some, just some uh, conclusions. So this is a very, if you want, um, uh, this is a work at a very early stage, if you want. So it's, a, it's very, there are many points that are not uh, completely clear to us. So one of the main points is that we would like to have a general systematic classification of our uh, obstructions or consistency conditions in taking our before and spin theory from this point of view. We would like to have this explicit description of what happens in those examples where duality does not commit to the orbifolds. And this is, and the difficulty in doing this is a bit related to uh, this other point here, because you have really to study the, in detail, the consistency condition to uh, try to classify all possible orbifolds from this point of view. Uh, now, orbifolds by non abelian groups might be uh, more complicated. Uh, you might want to, um, study orbifolds um, for theories which have uh, asymptotic ATS space time instead of asymptotic Minkowski. And that would be very interesting because uh, you can use holography in this case and try to express um, the like orbifold from a string theory point of view in terms of uh, the, the dual conformity theory. And in, in that case, there is a very like uh, um, natural um, guess of what the orbifold is from the dual uh, CFT, uh, from the dual boundary theory, because in the dual boundary theory, the, the um, gauge groups in the bulk become uh, global symmetries. So what the natural guess is that the orbifold is just given by uh, taking the obvious uh, orbifold, so the obvious gauging of this global symmetry of the boundary. So the difficult point there is to translate this proposal on the boundary uh, to uh, to interpret this from a, from a space time point of view, from the bulk point. And, okay, there are various other um, questions. And uh, in particular, I would like to understand if this kind of um, perspective on string theory orbifolds uh, might lead to more general kind of orbifolds than the, just the worship, uh, the ones that you can obtain by orbifolds of worship theories. Okay, I apologize for the uh, so I thank you for 